Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Thank you all for joining us for our next session. My name is Laura Vaselli. I'm the Senior Manager of Research and Foresight here at eCampus Ontario. And I'm here to introduce and moderate our next presenters. We have Adam Hopkins, the Senior Vice President Academic from FNTI, and Ashley Miracle from the standalone, sorry, the Academic Dean Standalone Programs from FNTI. Their presentation today will offer insights into FNTI's bundled and community-based micro-credentials. As a recipient of the Micro-Credential Challenge Fund from the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, FNTI set about developing 21, yes, I said 21 micro-credentials that were bundled across five disciplines. The project scope included curriculum development, de partnership development, development of a prior learning review and renewal tool, and administrative costs. The micro-credential project has been incredibly beneficial for the academic team to test their unit's readiness for delivery of standalone programming and has furthered their institutional readiness to launch FNTI to lead degree level programming. And before I turn it over to them, I think I speak on behalf of all of our attendees today to congratulate you on the, being the recipients of the Community Impact Award. And I hope we hear, can hear more about that throughout your presentation. So that's it from me and I will pass it over now. Thank you. All right, thanks, Laura. Um, Kulamalsi, uh, Akatak Indigenikas, Elanapi Lakweed and Donjaba. Um, Nagojarong and Donji, um, Ishken and Dodum. Um, greetings, uh, happy to be here. Uh, like Laura said, my name is Adam Hopkins. I'm uh, the Senior Vice President Academic at FNTI. I've been at FNTI for uh, just about seven years and uh, previously spent um, almost 10 at Trent University in Peterborough. So uh, again, happy to be here and I'll hand it over to my colleague and friend Ashley to introduce herself. Yeah, we'll go ahead, Adam. Say go everyone. My name is Ashley Maracle. I'm Mohawk from Tainanega, and I'm the Academic Dean for Standalone Programming at FNTI. I've been with FNTI for about two years and came to FNTI from another Indigenous Institute, um, Six Nations Polytechnic, and prior to that worked at the Ministry of Education and at Queen's University as well. So very excited to be um, joining FNTI's team and very excited to share a little bit more about our project today. All right. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to uh, to Robert and to the team at eCampus for giving us this opportunity to speak today. Um, and thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Um, I didn't realize 21 micro credentials was a lot. So I thought this was a small project. But, um, I guess it's not. So. Um, so just a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today. So um, we're going to give you a bit of a background uh, on FNTI and the Indigenous Institutes, um, just for those who are a bit unfamiliar with um, uh, who we are. Uh, we're going to give you a bit of an overview on what our plans are in terms of accrediting programs and, and degrees and credentials, uh, and how it fits into our plan for micro-credential development. <clears throat> and talk a little bit about our development process, which I think is pretty unique, uh, although I can't say that for sure, but uh, uh, we, we like to think of it as a as a very distinct uh, process. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about our micro-credentials that are currently under development. And then we're gonna talk a bit about how we're delivering them and uh, what uh, and how it's impacted our internal planning as a new member um, to the sector in Ontario. So first of all, um, FNTI is uh, one of nine indigenous institutes in Ontario. Uh, we are one of the biggest. Uh, we are, I believe, the oldest. We're in our 37th year uh, in existence. <clears throat> uh, we are the third pillar of publicly assisted post-secondary in the province. Um, we uh, were one of the first uh, Indigenous institutes to go through an organizational review. So as of 2017, Indigenous institutes in the province were recognized as the formal third pillar of publicly assisted education in the province. Uh, so we completed that uh, process a couple of years ago and immediately started our planning for uh, credential uh, reviews as well. And currently we have a whole suite of, uh, of programming underway that, uh, that Ashley is going to talk about. So Ashley actually oversees all of our uh, programming that is what we refer to as standalone programming. Uh, and there's a whole suite of things that we have underway that she's going to go over right now. I'll hand it over to you, Ashley. 
Okay, so as Adam was saying, the standalone programming is a relatively new unit within FNTI. Um, within our portfolio, we currently have everything from micro-credential to postgraduate degrees um, under development. So it's very exciting and very um, engaging work for us as well. Um, within our unit, we've got five degree programs under development, and Adam and I were joking earlier that our self-study application for the Bachelor of Indigenous Social Work will actually be submitted tomorrow. Uh, and so that will be the first program fully accredited through FNTI, which is very exciting news for us. Um, the program actually does have regulatory accreditation already. Um, we've gotten candidacy status to run that program, so we're very excited to be um, in the final stages of, of program planning for that. Um, we've got certificates and diplomas as well, and the handbooks for the self-study applications for those just came out recently, so we're looking forward to getting those applications started as well. Um, and then we've got the transition support programs and micro-credential programming underway, which for us has, has supported a lot of our internal process development um, has really allowed us to expand our community and employer engagement and is getting us system-wide ready for launching all of our, our programs. So in terms of our approach to development, FNTI has been utilizing program advisory circles to support us in our endeavor to develop, deliver, and evaluate programming. This has allowed us to make sure that it's really grounded in that um, Indigenous way of knowing and community priorities as well. So, so far in our micro-credentials have been a really good example of this. Um, members of the PAC have been bringing forward perspectives from partner agencies and community organizations um, that have included members such as the, M the Métis Nation of Ontario, um, TI, which is an, indig uh, an Inuit organization, and um, additional First Nations members as well. So that one's been very exciting to move forward. They've helped us ensure that the programming that we're developing is meeting community need and creates meaningful employment opportunities for graduates following their, their program completion. We've been utilizing a collaborative development model and ceremonial um, MOUs with some of our partners as well, which Adam will speak to a little bit later. And for the micro-credentials under development, they've each been mapped as a bundle. So making sure that we've got a key kind of theme and then building out individual micro-credentials within each bundle that can help um, ensure that there's learner choice and selection within each bundle. So we've decided to move forward as recognizing a certificate of completion after the develop or after the completion of three micro-credentials. Um, but each of the bundles actually has a number of additional micro-credentials within it, and that really allows learners to be able to come in and select the, the content that they feel they that would best utilize um, or best support them in their learning journeys. And maybe, uh, Ashley, if I could add something here about, um, about the mapping elements. So, so this approach to uh, the bundles um, aligns with what we've been doing uh, with existing uh, degree development. So um, uh, we've been very deliberate about uh, creating uh, programming that's mapped to a specific, um, uh, well, a, a very deliberate way. Um, Ashley, maybe you, can, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, about um, how it's broken down. Um, um, within the uh, Common Core Cultural Curriculum. I think there's some relevancy here. For sure, yeah. I think in terms of the, the way that we've bundled them, we've been able to engage a program advisory circle for each of those bundles. And so in that engagement, we've gotten recommendations and the Community Impact Award really allowed us to expand upon um, the development of each of those micro-credentials. So the 21 is the, the base micro-credentials, and then we've actually since added a number of micro-credentials to the, the portfolios from there. Um, part of what that's allowed us to do is 
speaking to the, the cultural core competencies pieces, um, we've been able to really ensure that each of the bundles speaks best to what employers and some of our community partners are looking for. Um, one of the things that, one of the examples that we can provide for the Indigenous Relations Bundle um, is really looking at building out some of our, our allyship and meaningful engagement um, content. And so those were really, really supportive conversations that we had through those PAC, PAC meetings. Another one of the projects that we did want to speak to, um, and this helped launch us off into the micro-credentials, was the 2021-22 eCampus grant. Um, and this was a tri-institute project called the Good Red Road. So this was done between FNTI, Kenjigewinteg, and Seven Generations. And it's one of the first bridging programs that's been developed across multiple Indigenous institutes. So we're able to recognize the program collectively um, and it will be supporting PLAR and learning, learning readiness. Um, and maybe I can add something there, actually. Yeah, about yeah, the PLAR. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so uh, you probably noticed we spelled PLAR wrong. Uh, that's, that's not, uh, that was actually intentional. Uh, so uh, funny enough, FNTI was one of the um, uh, original in, uh, institutions in, in the country that uh, led PLAR development years and years ago. Um, the reason we've called it PLRR is uh, what we've reframed that, um, that idea and now refer to it as prior learning uh, recognition and renewal. And the reason we framed it that way is because we have, uh, we will be having uh, learners entering our institutions who are bringing with them uh, their own gifts, uh, their own uh, languages, experiences, cultural knowledges. And so uh, we have decided that it's uh, important for us to recognize some of those experiences and gifts that those learners are bringing. And so uh, the reason we've called it uh, prior learning recognition and renewal is because uh, we don't see ourselves in a role where we determine whether or not the knowledges um, languages that they potentially bring uh, to the institution. Uh, it's not for us to validate that, it's it's for us to polish that and, and to renew it. So so that's a really important element of that uh, project that was also actually funded by eCampus, e uh, led by uh, Kenja Gamenteg, but um, another project that we're really, really excited about and will uh, we'll ground a lot of other work at the institution. So sorry to interrupt, Ash. No, not at all. And actually, I'll, um, I'll pass it back to you to update about the RPAS. Yes, yeah, another exciting, uh, another exciting piece of the puzzle here. Um, so FNTI has a um, an aviation program. We have a three year um, advanced uh, diploma in flight. Um, so uh, one of the uh, one of the things that industry uh, that community have been asking for is um, uh, curriculum programming that will recognize uh, drone operators. So. Um, I, I completely forget what that acronym stands for, uh, Remote Piloted Automated Systems. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, so uh, this will be another area of development and uh, focus for our micro-credential programming is uh, for drone operators. We recently became a uh, delivery site recognized by Transport Canada. Okay. So some of the, uh, we wanted to talk a bit about uh, how we originally engaged uh, some of the organizations that we've been working with. Um, so the first one we wanted to talk about was um, an organization called the Aboriginal Shelters of Ontario. <clears throat> so the reason this has been one of the more powerful uh, partnerships for us is because um, this was a, originally an organization that reached out to us. Uh, they had a need to upskill their workforce for folks who are working in um, women's shelters in uh, communities across the province. Uh, so they reached out to us years ago and asked us to uh, develop uh, programming for those folks who are working in those shelters. Um, so the reason this has been um, uh, 
a big area of focus for us is because it's such a strong partnership. And the reason it's such a strong partnership is because um, they asked us to start this partnership and ceremony. So, you know, we set aside those typical kind of MOU agreements and negotiations and discussions, and we went to them. We brought um, some of our faith keepers with us, and we had a very intense day-long uh, ceremony that was grounded in uh, Haudenosaunee teachings. Um, and the reason that's important is because those ceremonial elements really lay out the uh, uh, responsibilities that the partnership will have, lays it out in a really clear way, um, and really sets the, a strong foundation for moving forward. Um, that partnership in particular, uh, the folks that we've been working with have really been driving um, how we develop the programming and, and how we're ultimately going to deliver it. And uh, we feel that it's so strong because of those ceremonial elements that uh, really grounded that relationship. Um, another, uh, you know, collaborative partnership that we're really proud of is with a uh, child and family wellness agency in the, in the province. Um, we've been meeting with them and, and talking about how we can upskill their workforce. Uh, there's a number of uh, Indigenous child and wellness agencies across the province that have been taking over um, from uh, traditional children's aid society um, organizations, and they have a really really big need for hiring Indigenous social workers. So they reached out to us and asked us to help with upskilling their their uh, their staff as well. And so that's been a big area of focus for us in, in developing our uh, micro-credentials to meet their needs. Uh, and not just from a curriculum perspective, but also from a delivery perspective. Uh, so we've been, we've been talking with them about, um, you know, how to organize uh, not just the micro-credentials, but also our um, uh, future degrees to really fit with what they need. And so that's been a really impactful partnership as well. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is our um, our focus on uh, costing options. So we have a number of different ways that we've been um, costing out the micro-credentials for the folks that we're working with. Um, I see that I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to go through this really quickly. Um, so we've got three costing models. One is a at-cost um, costing model. So when we work with these community organizations that have reached out to us and helped us out with de developing the curriculum for these micro-credentials, it's at cost. Uh, we have another, um, another model where uh, we're working with nonprofits where there's flexible negotiated um, delivery models. And then a third uh, stream where we work directly with industry or large organizations for um, uh, uh, programming that would be, um, I guess we could think of it as a revenue generator. And then the last thing I want to talk about here is uh, it's also helped us get ready for OSAP. Uh, like Ashley mentioned, we're going to be uh, delivering degrees uh, in the coming months, and uh, it's helped us get ready for that because uh, we're going to have a lot of learners that are going to need financial aid uh, that will be coming to the institution. And I'll hand it back over to you, Ashley. Yeah, we'll go ahead. I'll um I'll keep mine relatively short as well because I do see we're we're running out of time as well. But um I think to just elaborate a little bit further, I think part of where this project has been really beneficial for us as an institution and especially as an Indigenous institute um, is that we've been really ensuring that we're working towards system readiness and getting all of our processes um, streamlined and and solidified and that has been incredibly helpful so we're looking forward to to being able to launch all of our programming um, in terms of this year with the um with the readiness internal readiness that that's kind of where we've been referencing it as we've been able to systemize a lot of processes and build out all of our um, internal systems to make sure that they're communicating appropriately so that's been very helpful um, and I think I'll just end my portion of this by saying that we we have really looked forward to and are very appreciative of the the partnership engagement that we've been able to um, to have. And so the entirety of our project wouldn't have been successful without all of those partners. So we just really want to make sure that that's um, that that's well known and yeah, Niao Gua for, for coming and hearing a little bit more about our presentation. I think we'll, uh, I think we'll stop there. I got threatened to stop right at 20 minutes, so we, we did it. <laughs>
Fantastic. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Ashley. I don't think we want you to stop, but I do think we have some people in the chat who'd like to ask some questions. So we did get one and I'll just pull it up. Um, so our first question, uh, so, and I'll just read it out. It says, dear speakers, thank you very much for this inspiring presentation. I recognize some of the themes and issues. In the EU, we are also exploring several aspects of micro-credentials and RPL. A small question. A, what is the size of your MC, minimum, maximum hours and credits? B, can learners take only one micro-credential of a bundle and get a certification of that one micro-credential? So maybe that, you know, sure. speaking to I the can, bundle and, yeah. Yeah, I can jump in there. So the Beautiful. way that we built out our micro-credential framework, we made sure that each micro-credential reflected a 15-hour in-course delivery. Um, the bulk of the programming right now is synchronous delivery. We do have one that will be asynchronous, and that's actually the Aboriginal Shelters of Ontario Partnership one. Um, and that was a specific request from the employer to ensure that learners would be able to do some of that, that curriculum throughout their time. Um, and given the the understaffing currently within their sector, we wanted yeah. to make sure it was as flexible as possible. So that one has been built asynchronous, um, but all micro credentials at FNTI are currently 15 hours. Great. Um, learners are able to enroll in an individual micro credential, although they wouldn't get recognition for like the recognition piece until they completed three within a bundle. Yeah. Um, that said, they could request the transcript and that would have the individual micro-credential on it. Great, fantastic. I think that answer too, oh, I see lots of questions coming in. I'll just say highlights a theme throughout your presentation, which really is that larger learner agency and the, and the choice that they can have to pick the micro-credentials that are suited to their needs that recognize their, their prior learning experiences. So let me go to this next one in the chat. And it says, are there relationships between the micro-credentials and diplomas and degrees? Are the micro-credentials part of one degree or another? So I can speak to this. And part of our approach as an Indigenous institute, we do have, um, we've got a lot of micro-credentials that are in the same sector as mm. the degrees that we're building out and the certificates and diplomas. Our rationale for that was that because as an Indigenous institute, part of our mission and our strategic um, goals is that we'll be helping to improve systems like sectors right. as a in a broader sense so while we do want to have graduate or like learners coming to us for you know certificates diplomas and degrees we also recognize that there's a lot of people within the sector already who have post-secondary um, who would not be coming to us for another four-year degree right. so in terms of making sure that we We've been internally kind of joking that it's a primer um, mm. for some of those workplace environments that we'll be sending graduates out to in the next four to five years. Um, so how can we support some of those sectors that we're trying to get graduates into? And for us, part of that is providing micro-credential programming to people that they'd be working with. Um, and so there is overlap in that way, but there's a bit of a, a dual approach to that. Right. And I think that systems approach is helpful as you continue to grow. Adam, you mm -hmm. said, you know, you didn't know 21 was a lot. And then Ashley, later you said it's actually more than that. So definitely is a lot. But um, <laughs> there's a, there's another question here in the chat that mirrors something I had noted, too. Um, this is about the prior learning recognition and renewal. And Adam, you said their prior learning experiences, their gifts, their languages are not for us to validate and polish. And I really like the way you said that. And the question that came in the chat was, if you could speak a little bit to how that has been working in practice, that PLRR. Yeah, and just to, just to clarify, um, yeah, so it's not for us to validate any of that. It is for us to, to uh, renew and to polish. So right. oh. know, there's, there's some teachings around, um, uh, so folks who are uh, familiar with covenant chain teachings, it's part of for the Nishomi culture, and that's kind of revolves around that. But um so experiences so far uh we haven't had them because we haven't we haven't done it yet so we're so we're building the uh infrastructure currently to um and what i mean by that is the policies 
Oh. and uh, building the uh, capacity internally with our staffing to, to do that. Um, we are um, uh, lucky to have uh, a, a pretty substantive um, uh, existing policies, procedures, all that sort of stuff from our previous PLAR experience, but the right. it's definitely framed a different way. But um, uh, yeah, anyway, so uh, current experience is none. Uh, we are just readying ourselves for that. Right, right, fantastic. Um, and then just to elaborate on that as well, for any, yeah. because I, I am aware that a lot of people may not understand or know about covenant covenant chain teachings. Um, so for reference, that that speaks to the importance of continuous relationship maintenance and renewal. And so it's recognized as an ongoing re uh, relationship that requires both parties to participate. Okay. And so when we're looking at building out policies and procedures, that is reflected in that. That might speak to also another question we have, and that's about the program advisory circles that you mentioned. And it seemed like there was quite a, a diverse group of stakeholders. And when you have so many micro credentials, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to and maybe give any advice for folks in the crowd who, who might be looking to pursue something similar, how you how you collect that feedback and how you integrate it into your micro credentials as you're building them in tandem, collecting that feedback and making those changes. For sure, I can speak to that. So we met with our program advisory circles once a month. And as we were building, we would be bringing parts that we wanted feedback on to the group, having them participate in discussion and dialogue and be able to get active feedback. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I am facilitating circles like that is to make sure that we have a deck and that we actually have it um, as a shared screen and we're actually actively in putting what people are saying as they're saying it so that they can make sure that it's, it's mirrored back to them in real time. Um, and I think that that's something that's really important, especially when we're doing in, like Indigenous engagement, um, is to make sure that there's multiple channels of feedback and, and validation of what we're hearing is what we're, we're taking down as, as our minutes and the recommendations from there would come back each month. So we would do a bit of a, a summary of the discussion prior. We'd update on the, the progress made and then continue to jump in and get additional feedback. And a good example of this actually, um, when we were talking about each micro-credential being 15 hours, the way that um, this was broken down, and I'll, I'll give a shout out to Dr. Joyce Hummer for, for a lot of this, um, we broke down each micro-credential into five three-hour sessions. And so when we were doing um, engagement with some of our packs, we would reference those sessions as five key seeds. Um, and so when we were talking about, let's use um, one of our, our micro-credentials was on truth and reconciliation. So when we we're talking about tr truth and reconciliation, we wanted to identify with the pack what those five key seeds would be, and then those would become the module titles as we were working through them. And so it was a lot of active engagement and active listening and, and continuous uh, mirroring back to the group to make sure that what we were hearing was accurate. And then of course, making sure that that content got to curriculum writers as well. Fantastic. That seems like an incredible amount of work on your end and your team's end. But to your point, it really helps make sure that the ca that feedback is being captured robustly so that it's actually actionable, right? And you're not caught in a communication loop, if you will. I see we have one more question, if I can have you for another minute. And the final question is, is evaluation built into each micro-credential in order to receive the credit? Yeah, I can speak to this one as well. Um, so we have a self-evaluation element of each micro-credential. And so there's questions at the end of each module. And then at the end of each micro-credential, there's evaluate, like self-evaluation pieces that do relate directly back to the competencies. Oh, perfect. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fantastic. I think we, I'm just double checking yeah, no more questions for now. Um, I know you both have a very big deadline to get to tomorrow, and I want to thank you both for coming and sharing with us. I'll encourage everyone to watch FNTI and all that's coming out, and I know you're both incredibly busy, and I thank you so much uh, for sharing your experiences with us. Thanks, Laura. Happy to be here. No, thank on. you, everyone. Much.